So is everybody ready for some training? Looking at a train passing through Hondo, Texas, getting back on schedule here, and I do need to tell you that when we get storms like what we had Monday in our local area, sometimes that will throw our schedule off for a day or two. Not always, but they do have effects from time to time. So we're going to get things back on schedule here. Let's take a look at this satellite photo. We've got thunderstorms up there in Ohio. There's a look at the storms there. It's kind of fascinating seeing the storms for exactly what they are. You get rid of the political boundaries and you're just left with the cloud forms and the textures. For example, transverse bands, stratocumulus out ahead of these cells. Now, sometimes your transverse banding is associated with severe structures. However, if we bring up the soundings and look at the environment in that region, not very much instability there. Definitely some shear, SRH up there above 100, and you can see that in the 0 through 1 kilometer wind flow. However, the convective outlook's showing a slight risk for much of Ohio as well as the Carolinas and southeast Georgia. And a couple of watch boxes in effect, severe and tornado watches up there in Ohio and another from Jacksonville northward. Let's take a look at that surface map. Yeah, it definitely looks like spring. We've got 70s all the way up into Ohio. That's helping to feed those storms. And those are north of this warm front. And I probably, yeah, I probably should have brought that front a little further north because there's cold air damming in Virginia. Temperatures in the 50s right there. And then 70s here. There's been faster warm air and moisture return out there west of the Appalachians. So I would probably bring that front a little further north and then link it up into the system I guess maybe up there near Finlay, Ohio. And that's where those storms are occurring at this hour. The warm front is a very potent ingredient for rotating storms because you can really bulk up that shear just north of the boundary. Occluded front, occluded low out there near Chicago. Triple point, I guess that's going to be out there near Finley and Dayton, Ohio. And then extending south as a cold front to Atlanta and Panama City. Elsewhere around the country, substantial cold air advection across all of the central U.S., gusty northwest winds in Texas, Oklahoma, and much colder up there in the Dakotas. But you can see that instead of single digits below freezing, we've got 50s, 40s, and 30s. And I guess the coldest air is up there near Duluth, near freezing with snow coming down. But this is a huge change from a few weeks ago, and we've even got 70s in Montana. There's the return of the lee side trough. That's always an indicator of strong zonal flow. And then as we go west into the Pacific, let's take a look at that area. Let's see if I can move that over just a little bit. Another system lined up to hit maybe British Columbia, Washington, Oregon. Then heading up into Alaska, continued cold air flowing off the Arctic Ocean Basin, minus 15 at Tuktoyuktuk, and then out over the rest of Canada, minus 20 at Resolute, and below zero down there in the Northwest Territories. So we're not completely done with winter. So this makes me wonder what's happening in the upper levels. Well, we do have zonal flow, but that's confined to the northern Rockies. Got 90 knot flow across that, broken up by this deep trough across the central U.S., co-located with the cold air. But overall, the long wave pattern as a whole is fairly zonal. Don't have very much of that ridging going up north like we get during cold blasts. So let's see what happens over the next several days. Run that forward. That trough starts filling in, moving eastward, approaching the east coast by Friday. Some ridging building into the Rockies. Overall, looks like a fairly dry day across much of the country, Saturday, going into Sunday. But 
things are starting to deteriorate once again in California. Got this jet digging into Southern California. That's going to be around Sunday towards the end of the weekend. Going into Monday, things go rapidly downhill in the southwestern states. And you can see that jet snaking into New Mexico and Texas. Got the difluence aloft and a very strong westerly component. A pattern like this is going to support strong cyclogenesis out there in New Mexico and West Texas. So we're going to be alert for the appearance of maybe more severe weather early next week. And let's see how things shape up for the remainder of the week. That trough gradually moves eastward, so it kind of looks like a carbon copy of this week. And another trough descending on the backside for April 2nd. So what is the all-important chart we want to use to substantiate the possibility of severe weather Monday, Tuesday? Anybody remember? Yeah, that's going to be the 925 millibar dew point. And that'll give us an approximation of the low-level flow. Let's run that forward. And you can see that starting out today into tomorrow, we're going to deplete the Gulf of Moisture, push it all the way down to Yucatan, Cuba, and Bahamas. By Saturday, we're looking at high pressure across the western Gulf, which will continue the offshore component in Louisiana, Alabama, Florida. But eventually, as that surface high migrates to the east, we get the return flow on the other side. And that starts bringing up the little bits of moisture that we have. And eventually, at some point, we should tap into the main body of moisture. That's it right there. That's going to be early Sunday, helping to prime the environment. This kind of looks like a warm front up there in Oklahoma. Don't really know that for sure. And then going into early Monday, there's the moisture surge into Texas. And then around Tuesday, we see the deeper moisture arrive. Looks like one surface low moves all the way to Nebraska. So the possibility of a I-35 event for Tuesday. Let me go back to Monday, see what was going on. Yeah, Monday still looked pretty early in the moisture return phase. So maybe nothing definite that day. So Tuesday, severe weather. And let's see how things look for Wednesday. It kind of looks like a MCS marching eastward. Tuesday night into early Wednesday. That's it right there. You can see the moisture depletion out there in Texas and Oklahoma. So things should shift eastward. That's how things look at max heating on Wednesday. So some possibility for severe weather in the Mississippi River Basin. And then going into Thursday, things shift eastward. And then we're looking at maybe Alabama, southwestern Georgia, at that point. And you can see once again, the offshore component is back. That's very typical of late March and early April. Return flow sets up once again for the following weekend, the second and third. And yeah, that's some fairly stout cyclogenesis there in West Texas. Cold front right here across Midland, Roswell, warm front, maybe somewhat like that. So some possibility for severe weather around Abilene for Saturday the 2nd. But I don't know. That's a pretty good blast of cold air coming in in its wake. Look how strong those winds are at max heating, 25 knots out in the north. So any storms there could rapidly get undercut. But, you know, we're 250 hours out. Let's not analyze this into too much detail. Anyway, it does look like a lot to look at over the next couple of weeks. Temperature records, those are always interesting to look at. Those characterize a lot of the unusual weather we get, and they've definitely got that in California, not the most favorable kind, but 80s and 90s, 91 at Burbank this afternoon, and 83 at Sacramento. Those are all breaking records for the date. And not to be outdone, the eastern U.S. with that warm surge coming up from the south, 89 out around Orlando and 79 at Jackson. Here's how things look for tomorrow, focused entirely on California and Nevada 
We definitely don't like seeing that because that helps accelerate the moisture depletion, the ground moisture, and dries things out for the summer. And by the end of the year, you're looking at a pretty favorable pattern for wildfires. The hot weather shifts a little bit to the east for Friday. Records in Nevada and starting to show up there in Arizona with 94 at Phoenix. For Saturday, the record break in temperatures stay locked in Nevada and Utah. And there's an absence of record breaking cold. And that's kind of been a trend ever since we started these maps. And it does make you wonder if climate change is responsible. A bit of an eastward shift for Sunday. Colorado warms up into the 70s. And we see 87 at El Paso and 83 at Winslow. And finally, for Monday, a record low shows up. 23 at Westfield. Up there, I think that's Massachusetts. And meanwhile, warming up in Texas with near 90 degree readings. For Tuesday, DFW comes up to 88 degrees, tying the record, but we know from the map sequence that there's cold air lurking right up to the north. Checking in on Big Rig Steve, he is in northern Nevada near Winnemucca, heading westbound towards the Sacramento area. No weather to report. It looks clear up there, and of course they are going to get that heat wave this weekend. And he's right up here where there's clear blue skies, nothing to report. And it's pretty much all that way from Sacramento, Reno, all the way to El Paso. Only in Texas do you pick up the elevated convection. That's going to be cold core stuff. If we refer back to the map, you can see how cool it is, 40s and 50s with dew points in the 20s. And there it is, cold blustery convection working down from the northwest, and the fast flow, the fast movement, should clue you in that this is rooted in the mid-levels of the atmosphere. And I figure we can check in on the text.cameras, dot cameras, maybe see if we can get a look at some of that stuff. Well, already I can see dust blowing. Yeah, there it is. That's that's blowing dust. Unfortunately, these are not pointed at the sky, so we're going to have to do without. Yep, that's kind of a grim sight there. Kind of resembles a hazy day in Newark or something like that. The northwest under the influence of a frontal boundary that's still pretty far to the west affecting mostly Seattle and Portland. Out ahead of it, lots of mild air. Looking at the central U.S., you probably remember the main low-pressure area around Chicago. So this is going to be the deformation zone up to the northwest. Cold air advection coming in in the low levels, producing a lot of this stratocumulus and altocumulus. As we drop south, we get into the southern fringes of that cold air advection. The front located well out to the east. And that little shred of cirrus that indicates the possible presence of a jet. And there it is. Yep, 100 knot flow in South Texas. The southeastern U.S. under the influence of that advancing front. A couple of storm clusters in northern Florida. And in the northeastern U.S., yeah, those storms are still going to town. The thermodynamics, they could be better, but the shear is certainly there. Just enough instability and shear to produce some rotating storms here and there. And there's how the storms look as we approach sunset. These are not really putting out huge anvils, so I think they're going to be kind of skinny, somewhat shallow convection. And these storms as well are moving rapidly to the northeast, indicating that they're probably embedded in some of the mid-level flow, not really rooted very well in the low levels. And the fact that the air here looks really clear suggests to me that there's an overwhelming westerly component in the mid-levels, helping to erode a lot of the low-level moisture. But we still have those watch boxes out, so they're not completely out of the woods. Storm reports indicating a little bit of wind and hail here and there. 
very scattered so far. And let me take just one more look at those forecast soundings. Let me bring up the precipitation panel. I want to get ahead of some of this convection. So maybe right there in the southwestern corner of Pennsylvania. So the moisture, not really that shallow, but the boundary layer dew points, low 50s, upper 40s. So that's helping to minimize the instability to a certain extent. But that shear, yeah, there's substantial shear there. So any cells that can become established near the ground will certainly be rotating. And there's what the radar looks like. Numerous cells, kind of disorganized. Did have a tornado warning for, I guess that's Athens, Perry, Ohio. That's been canceled. But any of these cells that are isolated and can really ingest some of the undisturbed inflow, those can have the potential to begin rotating. And if we switch over to the storm relative velocity, a couple of cells with enhanced velocity signatures right there, but the bulk of the remainder of the cell is not really doing much at this time. And right there in the clear air return pattern, you can see the existence of storm relative helicity. That's that turning of the zero line. If I go to a higher tilt, you can see that a little bit better. So the zero line, about like that. And that's shown as we get further from the radar. We switch from a east-northeast flow to a southeast flow up at about 5,000 feet or so. And that's that turning of strong flow, which has given us the enhancement of those SRH shear values. And I want to thank you all for joining. Again, for our supporters, I do apologize that we were not able to be on Monday or Tuesday. These storms, when we're directly impacted, they can be very disruptive on the home front. And I do ask for your patience. Hopefully, we'll be able to cover those storms when we're not affected personally. You know, when we're talking about Dallas, Oklahoma City, Amarillo being affected, we should be able to stay on track and cover that stuff. So again, thank you for your patience and we should be getting back to normal here. Anyway, we'll see y'all back here on Friday. Take care. Bye-bye.